Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us in Expanded Realities Conversations. I'm Sin from Art Science Museum in Singapore. Expanded Realities Conversations is Art Science Museum's new marquee program that connects with trailblazers in art and technology who are sculpting the possibilities of immersive media and extended reality technologies. The series of talks unfolds alongside exhibitions and projects presented in our 10th anniversary year, featuring artists, technologists and storytellers around the world who are creating at the frontier of the digital future and their groundbreaking projects. The inaugural talk was presented in June in conjunction with the premiere of Virtual Realms, Video Games Transformed at Art Science Museum, and featured the curatorial voices behind the exhibition, celebrated game designer Tetsuya Mizuguchi and Patrick Moran of Barbican International Enterprises. Mizuguchi and Patrick shared about the exciting work of the game developers, media artists and design studios who collaborated on the commissioned artworks for the exhibition. They also discussed how these experiences showcase the potential of video games as a contemporary artistic medium and how games are evolving beyond the screen to introduce encounters connecting physical and virtual worlds in extraordinary ways. Today's double talk, uh, to today's double bill talk extends the topic explored in the opening session and looks at how one of the leading immersive art creators and the world renowned theater company are harnessing technology to create story worlds in blended reality spaces, shifting the way storytelling can be experienced. We're exceptionally delighted to be joined by creative industry visionaries, Robin McNicholas, who is co-founder and director of London-based creative studio, Marshmallow Laser Feast, as well as Sarah Ellis, head of digital development at the Royal Shakespeare Company. Robin's practice centers around creating mixed reality story worlds and narrative works for live virtual productions that explore tactile multi-sensory interaction. He has directed the myriad of immersive experiences, large scale installations and live performances in some of the world's largest venues, concert halls and cultural spaces, including iconic shows for the Saatchi and Saatchi New Directors Showcase at Cannes. This year, Robin directed the Royal Shakespeare Company's Stream, a mixed reality theatre work that makes use of virtual production and gaming technology to imagine the future of live online performance. He's also one of the propelling creative forces behind Dream Shaping, an interactive installation in Virtual Realms exhibition that is activated by co-creation and collaborative play. It's very exciting to have Robin with us today, speaking first about his creative practice and how Marshmallow Laser Feast creates emergent spaces with their works. We are going to start with Robin's talk and we'll bring on Sarah for the second presentation in the program before concluding with the Q&A where we will take questions from the floor and would love for you to share your comments, thoughts and questions through the live chat, whether you are joining us from Facebook or YouTube. It gives me great pleasure now welcoming Robin McNicholas for the first talk in today's program. Hello and thank you so much. Um, I should start by thanking the Art Science Museum for being a beacon of hope for the likes of Marshmallow Laser Feast in that um, the XR scene really needs venues um, and entities on a global uh, level showcasing the kind of work that we create and that we strive for as a community. And it's a really important part of the puzzle. Um, in terms of Marshmallow Laser Feast, um, I've prepared a series of uh, slides that um, I'll now take you through that give you a, a snapshot of what it's like to be uh, running a company with such a uh, silly name um, and what our goals um, uh, for um, uh, exploring expanded realities um, and, and pushing the boundaries of um, how to in, engage and immerse audiences. We've created a, a whole swathe of uh, mixed reality productions in the past. Um, they've manifested in very different ways, um, but one thing that unifies them is that they're scratching the surface of this real-time interaction 
bringing um, user interaction into a live setting. So most more often than not, we are uh, presenting works for live audiences. And over the years, what we've seen is the as uh, productions um, embrace convergent uh, media, so traditional film productions that are now moving into virtual production, music, theater, gaming, it's all coming together. And we have placed ourselves passionately in the middle of all of this and work closely with um, different networks and different specialists to collaborate and bring our productions to life. One of uh, the key aspects is virtual reality and augmented reality. And it's important to acknowledge that VR, AR, and eventually XR just is an expression of the way in which our story worlds are presented um, to audiences. And they, of course, can be in a live physical space, but these story worlds can be presented um, and connected by the by the internet and um, upcoming technologies like 5G really excite us in the prospect of connecting uh, audiences that geographically are very separate. Um, along the way, one thing that we've observed is that XR can really pursue the multi-sensory. And one of the key sensors that excites me in particular it's a sense of touch, haptics. And um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about that down the line. But before I do, it's important to acknowledge that the way in which we make our um, projects these days, our self-initiated IP or whatever you want to um, um, call the XR productions, we want to recognize the fact that they're adaptive. They can visit spaces and reach audiences in very different ways. Um, for example, in the eyes of the animal here, um, uh, can be exhibited um, in galleries, in forests, on full domes, in, in the form of an app. And our working practice focuses on the creation of the story world first, and then the windows into that story world effectively um, uh, up to the um, way in which MLF um, engage with curators and different venues and festivals and places like that. Generally, cultural, cultural and arts institutions. So I mentioned, I uh, hinted at it earlier, bringing tactility to the metaverse, the sense of touch. Um, we've questioned along the line, why is everything that we interact with rigid? You know, we have trackpads, we have keyboards, glass and metal um, that we touch and swipe. Why can't you squidge or twist? And uh, so this is an area that we're really excited about. We're also excited about the prospect of um, um, combining physical and virtual experiences. So the part of the story is told through the fingertips. Um, there's whole topics that we could touch upon, such as wearables or physical interfaces. Physical interfaces uh, provide us with props and um, design elements that help tell the story and frame the XR experiences that we are making. And telling stories through the fingertips, just through the different uh, materials uh, when reaching out and touching, whether um, they are smooth or hot or cold, all are um, effectively within um, the studio's palette as a creation tool to make the work that we put out there. And we're experimenting with haptics in, in this image. You can see that there's a sub pack that's, uh, that can help effectively with the suspension of disbelief keeping people in the story story world immersed and engaged in the work. And uh, so this, this video is an example of um, a par participation. Audiences in XR become um, our actors sometimes. They bring our XR pieces to life. In this example, a colossal wave. 
people threw a bowling ball from a great height and caused a colossal wave that raged over the VR users under the um, umbrellas in a public setting. And so um, there's new dialogue and um, techniques to be employed when um, presenting work in public where the line between who is an actor and who is an audience member is blurred. Um, now, in the case of um, our works, space plays an important part. And so our projects are nothing without audience members entering these dynamic spaces. And what's interesting in this example of Laser Forest, um, it's, it's static, it's dormant until a person enters or many people enter uh, this environment and bring it to life. And the way in which this is designed because of its dynamic characteristics, it can be a very serene experience for an individual walking through the laser forest or quite a cacophonous hive of activity if many people are in that space. Underpinning MLF's work is uh, this importance and acknowledgement that R&D is critical. And so at any given moment in our lab, as it were, in our studio, we're working with the technical team to try and solve lots of um, issues that are obstacles in getting creative ideas out of our heads and into the real world. And often these are really technical and involve networking um, uh, predicaments and weird technical protocols. But um, uh, we've been fortunate enough to explore um, some very different deep dives, as we refer to them, in terms of uh, R&D, where we um, are funded specifically to solve problems. And one of those is um, the puppeteering and augmentation of virtual beings. So looking into ways in which we can augment people and puppeteer them in different ways. This is an example of um, an iPad app where we could puppeteer the facial expressions of, uh, in this case, a, a playful creature uh, from an, a remote person. In this example, what you're seeing is the tracking of other familiar deformable objects, physical interfaces, playful. You know, there's a inflatable palm tree there and a rubber ring as well. And we love this idea of bringing real world physical interfaces into the conversation. You know, you learn how to play with a rubber ring in a swimming pool or in a uh, or at a beach. And um, it's important to recognize that this doesn't require any prior training. You know, throw somebody a rubber ring, and they'll know what to do with it. You can squeeze it, you can put your head through it. Um, unlike an, an Xbox controller or a PlayStation controller where there's prior knowledge and information required. And in this example, just imagine in XR, if you put your head through that rubber ring, you could be transported to outer space. And so, Bringing real world examples into the mix is um, really important. Uh, sorry, bringing real world physical interfaces um, uh, is important. But tactility doesn't always have to be um, directly physical. Um, and um, it can be hinted at. And so in the project, we live in an ocean of air, which follows the breath cycle. Um, and we incorporate different sensors. Um, and we have a VR headset that tracks people's hands and people's positions in space. You can see one another, but you can also see your breath. And uh, the project questions where the human body begins and where it ends. And really what we're trying to do is connect people to nature and to the natural world and create uh, highly immersive experiences that unify people with the natural world and one another. Um, you see each other as, um, uh, as the vascular system in, in this case. Now, in terms of haptics, what's important here is, of course, you know, people you can see in this example are walking on a soft uh, floor surface. We pay particular attention to detail in, in terms of the materials. But there are also 
um, heart rate sensors um, and also breath sensors and and tracking of people that places them in the virtual environment and we use wind uh, and scent as well and so in terms of storytelling the subtle sense of touch uh, the sense of feeling um, uh, an array of uh, electric fans rigged in in the ceiling become um, a device in helping transport people into the canopy of a giant sequoia. And so there are subtleties in that, um, in, within the studio and playing with tactility it doesn't always have to be um, as one, to, we refer to it as one-to-one -one in terms of, um, there's an artistry and poetry around the subtle um, use of this technology. And that's something we like to explore. Um, you can see in this example um, uh, a kind of plan for oh, we live in an ocean of air in terms of the, I'd say the, the very different approaches to say if this was a storyboard for a film. There are many more multi-sensory considerations, you know, with the olfactory narrative, the scentscape, as well as the soundscape and haptic narrative. And these are all playing into one um, under one umbrella piece. And what's interesting is that the um, careful controlling of uh, these um, different nuanced um, sensory hues helps help with immersion. And um, it's really interesting presenting our work into the world and um, being able to iterate and tune the work that we create um, based on audience feedback. And uh, it's something that we've uh, grown to see it, as well as R&D as a really essential part of the process to carry out preliminary tests with audiences, um, to embrace that audience feedback through constructive criticism, as well as um, just plain UX um, problems that then allow us to revisit and dynamically alter the project to make, to make it more engaging. And if you were to consider a film model of shoot a film, edit it, lock it and distribute it, this exposes some of some closer similarities, I'd say to the computer game industry in that there's, a, there's an amount of iteration there. And, and, and feedback loops, which I think is quite compelling. We live in a notion of air I mentioned has uh, wind and scent units placed up above. And in this case, you can see the, the silhouetted um, uh, visitors to the experience create a, a kind of subtle performance as well. And this is a huge consideration uh, for MLF's practice and the use of projection and the pageantry of the XR um, uh, uh, UX uh, in very often incorporates real-time interactive projections and real-time interactive sound as well. You can see there, there's the uh, careful consideration in terms of the, uh, the, the, the tactile materials that we play with as well. And that leads to very different projects called Sweet Dreams that um, we are developing right now. It involves tracking individuals, it involves um, uh, taste and touch, scent, haptics. And uh, in, in the early stages of Sweet Dreams, we took this project to um, at the Sundance New Frontiers and showcased it. And again, allowed uh, the opportunity to inform the trajectory of the, of the production. And we're just hugely excited about the prospect of enhancing the human experience with the technology that's available to us. In this case, you can see uh, this ex extraordinary construction on the left-hand side is actually uh, a visitor uh, drinking the sun out of the universe. And so, uh, and it happens to taste of lemon and ginger. And, um, and I think that there's just something quite extraordinary to be, uh, said for incorporating our sense of taste into narrative works as well. 
A huge and uh, important role of Dexar is the back end and the control systems. And so we spend a lot of time trying to make um, accessible um, queuing systems and it, it effectively things that draw from uh, the theater and live music industry and uh, computer games uh, once again. And we place them in our spaces because XR, the XR spaces that we um, that we present to the world uh, as a key requirement involve human beings being in the space as well for safety, for accessibility, but also to, uh, in the case of Sweet Dreams, to, to cue events as well. And so to trigger uh, different scenes um, and, and worlds and just make sure that um, the experience for the audience member is as fluid and free flowing as, as possible. Um, to negate any kind of questions about, hey, is this a, am I supposed to be in this virtual world? Or is there a, uh, is this a tech failure? This is where um, there's a lot of care and attention placed on the invigilation of the uh, of the narrative works that we put out into the world, and the design, the production values are with you, the use of games engines um, are just getting more cinematic. Um, and what I love is there's convergence, not only with the CGI industry that is um, prevalent in commercial um, CGI as well as uh, the film industry and television, but also the, the, but the hugely interesting uh, motion graphics scene. We're really close to lots of motion graphic designers and um, we are passionate about bringing motion graphic design into the real-time realm and into the kind of cinematic pipeline that is um, on the horizon with both Unity and Unreal Engine, as well as um, the uh, more custom apps that we uh, incorporate in, into our work, such as VL, um, which we make, we live in a notion of airing. Um, but there's, you can see in the, these examples, um, the uh, the kind of deformable, squashable, uh, uh, more organic um, qualities uh, that physics engines allow us uh, to realize these days. And um, we, we feel it, it, uh, the future is bright for this. And so it, it was mentioned earlier, but at um, the Art Science Museum at the moment, we're so honored to be presenting our dream shaping project. And it is a project that we uh, collaborated with the Media Molecule team, a hugely inspiring entity who made um, Little Big Planet and have gone on to make the PlayStation game Dreams. And again, it, it involves motion capture, physical interfaces, um, interactive uh, audio as well, and it is extremely playful. And for those of you um, who happen to, to be close uh, to the art science space, we urge you to uh, go down and check it out. And um, what we found is, once again, this dynamic environment allows for the audience members to engage and interact in different ways. And this is designed for young and uh, Elderly people are like whole families can attend this this show that celebrates the, uh, the, the, the tactility um, and the ability um, to um, well prosthetic telepresence the idea of a phenomenon that us human beings have of being able to project ourselves into um, animated objects uh, beyond our physical form. And uh, uh, just a few more images there that leads into the audience of the future, the project that connects Sarah and myself. And I'm so honored to have been involved in this hugely ambitious R&D project that uh, culminated in the project Dream. It initially had a swathe of practitioners that we were absolutely in awe of, for instance, the immersive um, theatre company Punch Drunk, as well as the Philharmonia Orchestra, Manchester International Festival and the wonderful Royal Shakespeare Company. In 
addition to these creative entities, what we've done is work with um, a series of research entities that I'm sure Sarah will allude to in her presentation. But the experience of, of Dream that um, went live in March of this year was a huge, um, one of the biggest challenges that MLF have ever been faced with. I think I can say the same for all parties. It was a live virtual production um, and uh, presented to global audiences who could access it via laptops, uh, their mobile phones or tablets, and they could interact with the story world that we created um, and engage with uh, a, an acting company uh, who were being tracked in real time with mocap. And we managed to transport people into a story world and to create a seven by seven meter mocap volume into a seven by seven kilometer uh, forest that involved all kinds of hugely ambitious um, characters uh, and uh, environmental simulations. We took people into the canopies of trees and different perspectives of the forest. Um, and we had so much fun. And I think that um, as, as, as the director of the project, I miss it dearly. I miss the atmosphere that was created and the true collaborative um, challenge that we were faced with, which was, you can see, taking these primitive um, uh, uh, primitive objects on the left and, and putting artistry and transforming it into uh, an interactive experience that involved audience interaction as well as real-time composition of sound. Uh, the movement, and there's a quick example here, uh, I think a video will play for you, um, that illustrates how even the nuanced movement of each performer created an, uh, a dynamic score. And so th the dynamism of the character Puck, as well as the other characters involved, um, worked with sound design and music in this integrated way. And we are just so pleased to have put this uh, piece of work out into the real world. I think it's time for me to probably hand over now, but um, you can actually see the live performance of Dream um, at dream.online. And uh, we'd love to invite you to, to check it out. And um, you'll see, you won't see a live record, uh, you'll see a live recording of the shows that went out uh, between March 12th, and March 20th. Thank you, Robin, for giving us a snapshot of MLF's wonderfully multifaceted projects um, and sharing about the new spaces that are created with the combination of uh, multi-sensory interfaces. And it's so lovely hearing that um, the iterative development of these experiences happened with audiences' feedback. Uh, I'm delighted to be introducing Sarah Ellis. Director of Digital Development at the Royal Shakespeare Company, where she develops artistic initiatives and partnerships. This includes the Audience of the Future live performance demonstrator that explores the future of performances and real-time immersive experiences. Sarah was awarded the Hospital Club and Creatives Industries Award for a cross-industry collaboration with Intel and the Imaginarium Studios on the RSC's The Tempest and was listed in The Guardian's 100 Most Influential People Working in Gaming Technology. She has been appointed Chair of The Space, a digital agency established by Arts Council England and the BBC to promote digital engagement in the arts, cultural and heritage se sector. Sarah will share about the digital strategies and the collaborative R&D that have enabled RSC to continue innovating and be reactive to future audiences. And she will also lift the curtain on the making of the recent um, mixed reality theater project Dream, which you heard, heard a little bit about from um, Robin's presentation. And she'll talk about how RSC harnesses emerging technologies to imagine new possibilities for live performance. It's my pleasure welcoming Sarah for our talk. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for having me here today and also to Robin. And um, I hope you'll see why we were so excited about working with him 
and the marshmallow laser feast and and everything that we've we've looked at um, over the past few years. Um, I'm going to run through some slides and take us back probably about eight years um, of when we started to explore um, this work in more detail and, and my role at the RSC. Um, we, we are, our writer in residence is Shakespeare. He's over 400 years old. And um, to quote another UK cultural icon, um, I'd like to start with uh, a quote which means a lot to us, which was, is tomorrow belongs to those who see it coming by David Bowie. And it's in that spirit of who we work with, how we, work, how we bring collaborations together, how partnership is so crucial when we're looking at the future and how also it's so important to work with people that come from different disciplines because it's when you place those people together, something interesting happens. Um, and it's in that spirit that we've worked with our playwright um, Shakespeare and it's also how we've worked as a company. Um, this is our home um, in Stratford-upon-Avon and as many of you will have experienced yourselves um, within lockdown this space has been closed for the past 18 months but for hundreds and hundreds of years um, this space has been um, an area where everyone comes together um, every night and, and shares an experience together and it's something that we've been doing over a significant amount of time um, for us to have embodied and and evolved ritual. And I think as much as when we talk about digital technology or we talk about the new forms that are coming through, actually the disruption is more around the rituals that we place ourselves around having theatrical experiences or live performances. And also what matters about a shared experience? What does it give us? Why do we do that? What's the psychology behind it? What is that about? And at the Royal Shakespeare Company, working with stories that are 400 years old that still have a relevance today and are reinterpreted today, it's really important for us to reflect upon that and also know that theatre has always innovated. We've never not um, used the tools that were in Shakespeare's time to get the most ambitious spectacles of work. And it would be no different now for us to look at, um, Shakespeare to look at and his plays to look at the new technologies that are coming through, whether that's through a game engine or whether that's through online um, connect connections, that that wouldn't be a space for theatre to embody and for theatre to thrive. Um, but for us, um, one defining moment was the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death. And it was a, a moment for us to look at Shakespeare's last play, and arguably one of his most magical plays alongside A Midsummer Night's Dream, which is The Tempest. Um, and we're gonna share you a video now of uh, what collaboration was about for us in, back in 2016. We spotted that 2016 was going to be a big Shakespeare year with Shakespeare's 400th anniversary of his death, and the Royal Shakespeare Company needed to put on something pretty spectacular. We needed to try and match the magic of Shakespeare's imagination. Now, I got cast a long time ago for this new production of The Tempest, and the RSC is the home of Shakespeare. Not many actors get the chance to do things like this. It's taken the best part of two years for us to develop this technology with Intel and create an avatar to make Ariel fly, to create a sense of the island being a place where magic was possible. I boarded the King's ship. You get to see two fully-fledged performances, one of which is an actor and another is this apparition can fly around the space. To dive into the fire, to ride... We have unlimited versions of Ariel. We're able to change his form in many different ways. We are creating for the first time on stage, real time, live facial performance capture. And that is quite an extraordinary leap forward. I and my fellows are ministers of fate. The actor both becomes the marionette and the puppeteer at the same time. And you can see their physicality completely driving one to one this digital character. Men hang and drown. We keep working, keep trying to refine the way that Ariel moves, the way he talks, and I have no idea where it's going to go.
The technology that Intel deployed here for the Tempest is big. Take real-time information from a motion capture suit, map that on to a complex digital avatar, and then project that digital avatar out through 27 projectors. We have their desktop i7s to take marks, skeletal information, and a machine called the Big Beast, which has 120 cores. I've never seen a technical setup like this. This place is full of huge amounts of technology, much more so than most film sets that we're on. Generally, on set, you might say, let's fix that in post. You can't do that here. The avatar has to be so robust because that's the final product. All you can do is create the play with the tools that you have now. And what's delightful about this production is that we have pretty spectacular tools. affords us is the ability to encapsulate Shakespeare's vision, inclusive of all that magic, that wonder. The possibilities of what Intel have allowed are only limited by our imaginations. We're at the forefront of something that other people can take on and build. Who knows where things will be taken in the future. It's for other creative minds to see what we're doing and take it further. So that gives you an insight into our approach to how we look at the future of entertainment and what it is about how we use these tools and technologies. And back in 2016, that was a moment for us to have collaborated with a technology company, to think about those new, new tools coming into the theatre making toolkit, but also what you'll notice that that was on our, our main stage, the, R, the Royal Shakespeare Theatre stage. But in that um, project, we, um, we did a Snapchat filter, and for one day only, you could aerialize your face. And in that Snapchat filter, we reached 7.5 million people um, in in a day UK only and we ha we welcome about a thousand people into our building every day and that really sparked a next step moment for us which was we through collaboration we can create these unexpected things but how can we look now stages multiple places where we can have live performance not just a main stage but where are our new stages and that um, thinking came into the Audience of the Future project, which um, is, a, was, is a 14 partner collaboration of arts organizations, technology companies, and research organizations. And it was also about the RSC looking out, looking at collaboration, looking at people that can offer something into this space, get excited about that, and for us to push those boundaries together according to what our strengths are, and welcome people like Robin and Marshmallow Laser Feast into this mix to help us find the future um, for audiences, for makers, and to really push those boundaries of those new technologies coming into live performance for us to not think just about the rituals that we've embodied over the past 400 years, but convergence, convergence of form and what are those new forms coming through? And I'm delighted to say that a culmination of that was Dream, directed by Robin, um, collaboration with the Philharmonia, Marshmallow Laser Feast, Manchester International Festival. And I'm just going to play you now a quick trailer of, of for the performance. Follow me. And as you can see, I wanted to show those two videos because taking something on our stage and knowing what that looks like and taking that into the notion of world building, building a performance within a world. And as Robin said, um, the creation of a seven kilometers by seven kilometer forest 
and giving us the imagination to explore that, embody that through live performance was really crucial to us. But as you, you will have noticed that March 2021, we were in a lockdown situation. And one of the constraints that we were having to work with is that we had to actually look at what online audience, how we could connect with audiences and online was the main way to do that. And how, how could we create a welcome to those audiences that might be new to this experience? How could we look at those rituals and, and play some of those rituals so, so that our audiences would come into this performance and be welcomed and experience it in, in a live event way? And so we had to make a lot of the infrastructure to deliver this. And so we made Dreamed Online, which is where you can find the performance, but we also looked at the audience experience timeline. And that was really crucial for us to start with the audience provocation. And in that, it gave us three pieces of information. The audience research was telling us audiences were craving togetherness, they were craving liveness, but there was a huge digital inequity in people's homes. So this performance was made for desktop, tablet, and mobile, Look at using real te time technology. And these were huge creative um, constraints, but it allowed us to really focus. And as you can see here, the timeline of onboarding and interaction, and we had two um, experiences. One was passive and one was interactive. And we were, we were experimenting with how people could feel part of the experience when they were far away. This is the volume, a seven meter by seven meter volume, COVID state safe under really strict um, COVID parameters. This is the acting company with the movement director. And as you can see a video LED screen, that was the playback for the actors that they had um, the, the, the world of the play of which we created and what audiences were seeing. It was a really wonderful feedback loop between, between us. And it was a beautiful forest that was created, seven kilometers by seven kilometers that you could um, in, be, be absolutely absorbed in. And those characters were led by Puck. This is Puck, um, and you will have seen the clip that Robin just showed. And this is Puck lighted by the fireflies, lit by audiences. You could be, be a firefly, you could participate. And there was a connection, a real time connection between Puck, the character, and how you lit their way through the forest as a firefly. And on that way, Puck meets her char the characters of the forest, the, the moth, which you see here. And Marshmallow Laser Feast and, and Robin's team looked at each character elementally, um, brought in different design mechanics around each character and how it embodied the forest, playing with scale, all of those aspects potentially of what you can't necessarily um, play with in a conventional um, theatre space, working in game engine, working in a world, they were really able to stretch those boundaries of possibilities. And this is Puck um, playing with the character of Peas Blossom and Peas Blossom, this beautiful earthly character um, in the middle of the storm, not giving too many spoilers away. And then also underneath the forest and the mycelia network, Puck was playing with scale um, in, in, the, in the depths of the forest and then also playing around um, in different um, aspects of the forest, moving around and finding their way through and embodying the narrative through exploring. And as you can see here, this is Lauren playing Mustard Seed and her, she was face tracked and, and it was an incredibly interesting process to, to observe how the actors and, and movement director Sarah Perry and um, Robin really got the best out of the technology and how the actors change their performance techniques in order to achieve that. And I think one particular character is Cobweb, and Cobweb is the size of an acorn cup, an eye in the size of an acorn cup. And I can assure you that the RSC has never cast an eyeball before, and there were many firsts on this project, delightful firsts. And it's that ingenuity and um, uh, originality um, that we loved and playfulness of this project. And this is Puck shrunk down. But the motion capture behind that and how we achieved that, this is Maggie Bain who played Cobweb, was really looking at how she used her head and her hands to, to be the eyeball and changed her physicality so it wasn't a like for like motion capture experience. Using the craft of puppetry, 
using physicality, embodying that character to get the most believable um, digital character and for us to have emotional connection with these characters in this experience. And it's really important to stress that it was that connection and that really visceral um, convergence of broadcasting in real time, working with game engine, working with the um, character and environment artists, and also the physicality of the actors as well. It was incredibly important to, to bring that all together. And the rehearsal time within those COVID conditions um, was really important. And I think there's so much that we can think about going forward. So much we learned in that process. And also looking at traditional broadcast and um, multi-platform distribution, but the possibilities around virtual pr production tools and the convergence into broadcast mediums is, is a really interesting way forward. And, and I think that um, when we look at 2D distribution, so screen distribution, this was a 3D world and how that can be taken into a 3D space and immersed in um, multiple ways that this work can be taken forward in the future. And as I said earlier, there was, um, you could sit back, relax and watch the experience of dream, or you could participate and be a firefly in the experience. And this was a prototype test for us to see how we could create layers of connection, not just us showing the experience, but also audiences having some agency coming into the story and participating. And this very clever mechanic of um, lighting Puck's way, here are some uh, screenshots from how people could drag their mouse or their finger across their tablet um, and emit light into the experience where Puck could find their way. And again, finding those ways that we can have emotional connections with these stories when we're not present but we're co-present in literally but we're co-present we're there and and we are connected and how can this occur for not just four or five audience members but thousands of audience members and that takes me to the final bit of this talk today which is going back to audiences one of the brilliant things about collaboration is when you bring people together, you find something new. And within that, the press coverage meant that there was something exciting here that people were picking up on that was unexpected. This was research and development. It's a huge risk to put research and development out there and it not be perceived as finished product. And I'm really delighted to say that the partners all came together to demonstrate this as exploratory, putting a statement of intent out there around, around what the experience was. But some of the audience responses were some of the things that we just weren't expecting. People got really excited around the lobby that we created to welcome you into the experience and people could see how many people were coming into the show. And there was something really um, unexpectedly wonderful of people getting excited going, I've just seen, um, uh, more people come and as you can see here three of us super excited to be in the lobby with 5,014 5, pe other people that sense of shared experience around live performance super important and how we can find different ways to approach that taking our seats for the show looking at home as cultural space looking at us sharing a nar narrative looking at us being part of a world they're all set up for their trip to the Midsummer Forest. They were feeling that anticipation. And I think going forward, it's not just about the actor audience connection, it's how our audiences come together. And just finally, just to think about as much, this is about audiences of the future and how audiences tell us back how we should take our work forward and how we learn from that. That audiences, didn't need us to do everything for them. They made their own cultural spaces. They watched it in ways that were comfortable to them. They um, placed the experience in their homes where they wanted it to be and they created an atmosphere. And how is it that what actually happens in this moment is that we are coming into people's homes rather than people coming into our homes, which are our buildings. And how do we create ways that we can connect and, and be part of each other's worlds? And going forward, potentially look at persistent worlds, persistent narratives that we can dip in and out of. But we 
keep those wonderful things about togetherness and liveness and how do we disrupt those spaces and how do audiences feed back to us is super important on our next steps and that we can have a an experience that hits thousands of people in a moment but they feel so significant and i think that it's that sense of collaboration that um we've really got excited about audience of the future and how every single organization that we've worked with has not only contributed to this moment of dream but all of their own practices all of their own work going forward and we celebrate everyone that's taken part in this project and i think i'll stop there thank you Thank you, Sarah, for sharing about the beautiful philosophy behind RSC's work and the next generation virtual theatre prototypes like Dream that offer a different perspective of theatre making, um, but also a new way of working as a team and um, lovely opportunities to connect to new audiences through a different kind of um, communal cultural experience. We are going to a Q&A with both Sarah and Robin. So if you have any questions, comments or thoughts, please do share them with us in the live chat. I wonder if we could start with a question um, for you first, Robin. We became acquainted with MLF's work through um, your projects in the eyes of the animal, tree hugger and we live in an ocean of air. Um, this deeply Researched VR projects with very elemental stories, sculpted with the natural world at its center, convey such a beautiful open-ended journey um, and an emotional landscape that very much resonated with us. So how did MLF come to this intersection um, between art, nature, science and technology? And I also wonder if it makes sense to ask how much of the technology or the scientific part of the process informed the artistic perspective or perhaps the more philosophical aspects of your project? Oh, thanks. Um, let me just, I would say that the, the way in which uh, we have set up our organization is that we try and champion creativity and allow science uh, to, to inform that. But at the core of it is the human experience. So in all of the XR productions we've put into the world, we're trying to be sensitive to the vulnerability of audiences. Um, in the case of audiences wearing VR headsets, this now ranges to those who've never been in a VR headset to people who are in VR headsets every day. And we have observed storytelling techniques that that basically are, are wordless, that are meditative. And um, we realize that scientific information and philosophical, more spiritual approaches can coexist. And um, that if we are to progress as uh, human beings, well, we have to listen to the natural world and be sensitive uh, and realized um, the fact that we are part of that um, as opposed to separate. And so there is an underlying driving force to just make sure that that continues. Um, and really in, in that sense, there's uh, the collaborative process. We love collaborating with experts in fields we know very little about so experts who ct scan human bodies you know and uh, experts from really niche uh, areas of, of the world for example we worked with um, crystal experts um, to look at fraction of light and along the way the culture that has been built within mlf um have has just fallen in love with the fact that we can create meaningful experiences for audiences that celebrate the connections that we all have um uh, and a lot of the time they are aside from any language as well it's more felt and um uh innate in in all of us and we like to, we like to bring that out in, in, in visitors to our work 
Um, Sarah, it sounds like a big part of RSE's innovation um, in shaping and questioning digital tech, uh, narratives in the arts is also using technology to engage and immerse audiences. Um, the company seems to be very comfortable with stories appearing in different spaces um, and experimenting with different meeting points where art and culture are converging. Um, and one of RSE's first digital projects, if I'm not wrong, um, is um, Such Tweet Sorrow. And that was, for instance, performed on Twitter. And in the case of Dream, um, you put digital technology in the hands of artists for them to invert the technology and enable new thinking for live performance. Um, what makes this art tech partnerships work in the RSE context? And um, what kind of considerations helped um, you and your team manage the creative as well as the collaborative process around digital development? I think it's so such tweet sorrow was like in 2009, which feels like digital years are like cat years, aren't they? With the sort of development of, um, of work. And um, I think, I think whenever you're getting what we've seen in the first part of the 21st century is a huge proliferation of platforms and new, um, new ways of communication effectively. And yet you've got these plays that are 400 years old that have used a specific text in a specific way for a really long time. And, and back in the 20th century, you know, obviously broadcast and film, but it didn't, it didn't play with what I would call form. And the sense, if you look at reading, Instagram is a form of reading now. If you look at content creation and content duration, we had this moment where we were like, oh, are we all going to lose our attention spans because we're on the internet? And that's, I don't believe that's the case. What we've been given are these multiple platforms for reading, for performance, for creation. And I think Such Sweet Sorrow was a lovely playful moment for us to be to look at form and that play lasted six weeks. So not all, only are you looking at the, um, the form and the language, you're looking at the temporality of those experiences. And again, I go back to why we've wanted to work with Robin for such a long time, and he talks about it himself, is that in a way, take the text away and look at how we embody and we are experiencing performance, not necessarily with text, but with a huge amount of meaning. And I think as we move forward, those platforms as, much, as I say, as much as we've seen them on screens are pro proliferating into 3D space. And that's super interesting. And I think I've no idea where, whether I answered your question there. I just got very excited about, about that, that thread. But, I, but I, I think it is interesting around collaboration that actually to expand that um, performative world, it's really important that you work with people that are coming from those spaces very authentically otherwise we will use our cultural biases and they will remain if that makes any sense and that's really important so collaboration and partnership are really crucial when you're looking at new form um, on the topic of new forms, we are still very much um, figuring out our relationship to um, emerging technologies like VR as a new medium. Um, and some people believe that VR, when fully established, will change the way we live, we work and communicate with one another. Um, we are discussing new technology that has no ontological precedent um, and emerging technologies are inherently in a state of change. Um, and this discussion on art and tech is also very much an evolving one. So reflecting on each of your um, projects and the journeys that you've been on, um, I wonder if I could ask what are some of your main takeaways um, and perhaps what do you think is the role that art and tech play in the current moment and how do you envision things going from here? I think uh, to initially respond, I think creative pra practitioners uh, in particular have um, a role in society to um, to critique the norms. To um, in the case of MLF, we have pushed for um, an emphasis on celebrating the uh, the natural world and some of the other important topics relating to climate change. Uh, in particular, the Sweet Dreams project. Um, is exploring 
food that we eat, which of course is one of the biggest um, sources of um, carbon output um, in the world. And um, it's also quite interesting from a narrative standpoint in terms of how food becomes part of us, becomes our identity, and it's so um, loaded with culturally um, pertinent uh, information that I think um, is part and parcel of the world's natural resources and things like that. So um, what we want to do is take these important themes and recognize the impact that we can create and uh, that impact um, through immersion, through magic, you know, through the, in fact, through all the techniques that traditional theater in all of its glory still does brilliantly in the bricks and mortar spaces. And it should be emphasized that MLF as an XR organization, um, we, we love theater, we love cinema, we love traditional music venues as well but we also see opportunities to build on that metaverse, to build on the fact that experiences now, you know, they begin at the home, that you can have a live element and then they continue post event. And so understanding the different um, ways culture is evolving, especially during the pandemic, digital literacy has increased, meaning that those who aren't necessarily ex exposed to uh, digital creative works are more warm to the idea of engaging the traditionalists, I would say, but also being mindful of the fact that accessibility is a huge problem. We, we as an organization make VR experiences that we, we create bespoke environments where we get all the VR, all the tech settings to the highest level we possibly can get them and invite people to those black box spaces because we know that they'll have a good experience there. But we're also mindful of the fact that very few people in the grand scheme of things have VR headsets at home. And the Project Dream, I'm sure, Sarah, you'll be able to expand on this. Accessibility was central to the thought process. Inclusivity, um, uh, you know, not everybody is, um, wealthy enough to have the luxury of a VR headset or an AR headset, for example. Um, for that matter, not, not everyone has uh, internet connectivity as well. And so as we step forward within this scene, I think we have to be responsible as well. And that's something that I learned hugely from um, Sarah and the RSC in, in the, their approach to access and uh, inclusivity. Cool. Sarah, I wonder if we could hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think riffing off Robin, I think the connection between artists and technology is is the, they need each other and they need to talk to each other. Um, but if you look at how technologies have looked at accessibility and inclusion, we haven't, we haven't, if, if that makes any sense. And that if we can sort of look at what, if we look at this moment as a pandemic as well, how do we build towards an inclusive recovery? If we look at the design from an inclusion and accessibility standpoint at the beginning, not only do we give more access, but we give more opportunity for people to connect with that work. And that can only be a good thing. Um, and also if we look at, if we're looking at innovation, then it, it, it will be really interesting to look at the world, the world that we, we are part of and the citizens that we're part, you know, that we're part of and recognize that we we all come to this work from a really different place and that i think that's a really interesting disruption that artists can make with technology companies and and i think that that will um significantly and positively contribute to a really um fruitful um approach to how we adopt those technologies in the future 
on the topic of how the pandemic has um, displaced, but similarly offered new opportunities for us, um, we've got a question from Jerome. Um, Jerome says, lovely presentations. Um, and he's posing this question specifically to Robin. Um, Robin, do you think the pandemic will change how interactive a communal work like Ocean of Air is experienced? Certainly, we're mindful of that. Um, in terms of um, the pandemic, and uh, the, the kind of core health and safety risks. Um, we've led uh, lots of working groups on best practice in um, sanitization of headsets, for example, and, and things like this. So on a practical level, um, of course, the, uh, the venue and um, practitioners who are in the XR field inviting the public into spaces to, to wear things like headsets the pandemic has brought um, increased uh, focus and attention on the, the, the well-being and health and safety of those guests. And there's actually lots of tech uh, emerging um, in, in aiding that process. But I should also mention that as um, technology advances, um, the access is becoming uh, much easier as well. So for instance, um, we live in an ocean of air is an adventure that involves a, a backpack um, that you have to wear simply because the um, the graphic uh, the, the power of the pc that people are wearing on their backs is required um for the production values and and, and for the experience to work to the highest possible level but just around the corner with things like 5g um, access to these kind of things is changing as well and as the technology advances and there's a greater uptake, the cost of access is limited as well. And so just the other day, we were fantasizing about the bowling, uh, the bowling alley analogy of, well, some people like to attend the bowling alley and wear their shoes that are hired and use the balls that are there. But it might be a scenario with VR where people bring their own VR headset to these experiences as well. And so we're, um, without question, the pandemic has caused ripples and, and, and prompted the XR community to scrutinize um, health and safety, but also the, the, the way in which we um, create works that are accessible. But in parallel to that, as mentioned earlier, there's the digital literacy and the uptake and the fact that um, overall, we're a much more connected, um, digitally familiar uh, uh, global population. So we're hugely excited and inspired by the, the, the future and, and the prospects that we uh, can serve audiences uh, with our XR works and strongly believe in things like the uh, we have um, related questions from Rachel and Limin um, on production timelines. Um, so they, they, they're wondering what's the difference in production time between a less digitally focused um, RSC production um, and one like Dream or Tempest. So maybe Sarah first and then we can go to Robin after this. Um, goodness. Well, um, that's a very good question because we were given the just the most insurmountable challenge of the, the shortest possible window to make dream. And I don't think we could have made dream just as the RSC. I think that the working processes of Marshmallow Laser Feast and that studio style working really allowed us to be nimble and agile and quick on our feet in ways that um, most of our work will take a few years to, to come into the schedule and the programming and make that work. But what both projects such as the Tempest and Dream need is a, is a moment of R&D and research and development to, to look at those technologies, so which sits outside of what I would call the production, traditional pro production making processes. And I think it's that, that shift between R&D and production, which is a really um, important one and a, and a beat. But, but I have to say that, so Tempest probably took three, three years from start um, I think we approached Intel at 2013. But Dream was a completely unprecedented model. Um, and, and I would argue going forward, 
depending on what you want to do. But what was achieved in the time that we had was absolutely phenomenal. Um, so, yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a hard one to call, isn't it, Robin? <laughs> There's such. Um, yeah. It might be worth hearing how long it takes um, from an, a marshmallow laser feast production process to. Well, uh, just to put things into perspective, I think we we officially started in November 2020 on the dream production. There was um, uh, pre-production and some shorthand developed prior to that. Um, the dream, so the dream project went live in March this year. So. November and of course in the, uh, the with Christmas break as well we hit the ground running and we were all um, so emotionally attached and we just it was quite thrilling to engage in a project where everyone and, and the, there were I can't remember the actual figure but there were hundreds of people working on dream 375 people worked on dream <laughs> yeah and so to coordinate to yeah. um in, engage in a, a global collaborative effort we had um graphic artists in argentina sound uh, directors based in florida it was um a huge global effort um and all of us were learning on our feet so from November through to a live show in March, the um, rehearsals in Portsmouth uh, took place from January through to March. And um, it was just staggering. And we're very grateful for, um, the, uh, for the experience. I, just to frame it correctly, we had developed a real world, a real world IRL experience. Um, prior to this uh, project dream um, that was due to go live on June the 21st of uh, the year 2020. And so I think relationships, certain working practices and the opportunity to calibrate with one another, the Philharmonia with Marshmallow Laser Feast, Marshmallow Laser Feast with the RSC and all the other research partners. Um, we did lots of the important handshakes I think ahead of hitting the ground in November um, but I would say I crave it but I also fear that kind of working um, experience because we just lived and breathed it and I, I wouldn't change it for the world I loved it um, we'd love to close the program by looking ahead to the near future. Um, Sarah, are there any projects in the works that you can share with us? Oh, I don't know if I can. Um, we're currently evaluating Dream. To be honest, I'd love you to see Dream.online. That's what I really care about. And that's going to be available to the end of September. Um, and at the moment, you know, we're theatres, we're, we're gradually coming back, you know, um, mm. and opening our doors and, and and that's a really important moment for us so so we're very much in the present tense but if you watch dreamed online that will make me incredibly happy Robin we've heard that MLF is working on a project that centers around the subject of um, mycelium how much of that can you share with us mm. uh, we can <laughs> not share so much but um, we are um, lucky to have been in conversations with the author Merlin Sheldrake, for example, um, and uh, provided animations for a, a wonderful film that uh, I think in certain territories you can see on Netflix called Fantastic Fungi. And there's just something about visualizing the unseen and the, the, the beauty of um, the forest floor and um, the way in which trees communicate interests us a great deal. Um, but personally, my passion to turn Sweet Dreams, the project I showed a few slides about, which is a collaboration with us in the British Film Institute, is focused um, with lasers locked on to uh, the live production of that, which will, we hope, be an hour long ex uh, immersive experience that we'll be touring. 
Thank you so much, Robin and Sarah, for making time to take part in this second session of Expanded Realities Conversations to talk about your practices, um, share some of your truly progressive projects in art and tech um, with audiences. Um, we wish you both and the amazing teams at NL MLF and RSC our very best. A wonderful thanks as well to everyone who's been spending your time with us at today's program and the questions that we got from Jerome, Lemon and Rachel. Um, would love to hear your feedback, which you can share with us through an online survey by clicking the link um, that's just popped up in the live chat or by scanning the QR code on the top right corner of this video. Our third talk in this series will be live streaming on 27th July at 8 p.m. Singapore time. Um, this talk marks the launch of Art Science Museum's VR gallery with Hyper Realities, a collection of virtual reality works presented in collaboration with Acute Art by three of the most influential artists of our time, Marina Abramovic, Ulla Filiasson and Anish Kapoor. We will be joined by Swedish curator, art critic and artistic director of Acute Art, Daniel Bienbaum. He will share what it is like collaborating with internationally renowned artists who are exploring new technologies for the first time and discuss how extended reality is transforming arts and cultural institutions in ex inexplicable ways. The program will be hosted and moderated by our executive director, Ona Haja. We hope you get a chance to visit virtual realms if you're able to um, and experience the joyfulness um, that is dream shaping. Our wonderful team of education specialists are leading um, guided tours every Friday this month. And on the 23rd of July, my colleague Dina Razak, who plays a key role in the development of education programs and interpretive activities for this exhibition, will be leading a playful experiential walkthrough to illustrate how the installations in the six thematic realms transport video games from the screen into the galleries. You can stay up to date with everything that's happening at the museum and on our online content platform, Art Science at Home, via our website, Facebook page and YouTube channel. Um, and RSC Stream, of course, is available for viewing on dream.online until September. Um, it's been really lovely having all of you join us for Expanded Realities Conversations. Please stay safe and keep well in the meantime, and we hope to see you soon. Robin and Sarah, thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.